So we're joined today by Dr. Susan Coltis, who is Vice President Clinical Development with Tala Pharmaceuticals, and also Dr. Priya Gupta, who is Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at Duke University Eye Center in Durham. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. So let's just jump right in. At this year's Women in Ophthalmology Virtual Summer Symposium, attendees can learn more about Tala's product, candidate for the short-term treatment, and for signs and symptoms of dry eye disease in a poster presentation. So what are the main findings or takeaways from this poster presentation? Um, so the purpose of the study was to evaluate the safety and efficacy of a quarter percent KPI 121 versus vehicle in, in signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. And KPI 121 um, is a nanoparticle suspension formulated using Kala's Amplified Proprietary mucus penetrating particle uh, technology. So we actually had 2,871 subjects enrolled in the phase two and phase three studies. Only about 150 of those subjects were in the phase two study, the rest were in phase three. We had a, a study design for the phase three trials that started with subjects coming in with signs and symptoms of dry eye disease, including conjunctival hyperemia, corneal fluorescein staining, Shermer test, et cetera. They also had to have symptoms of dry eye disease, and the symptom was based on ocular discomfort severity, which was a modified Sandy scoring system that the patient filled out. So the phase three studies, the subjects came in and did a two-week run-in on vehicle alone, dosed four times daily. And then when they came for a visit two, uh, after, after that two-week run-in, they still had to meet certain criteria of dry eye disease. If they did, then they were randomized either to the quarter percent arm of the study, which was quarter percent, 121, dosed four times daily, or vehicle dosed four times daily. And then at Day 15, they came in for their final assessment. The phase two was only different in that it, it went two weeks longer. So it was a 28-day study instead of a 14-day study. The efficacy results in the signs area, conjunctival hyperemia uh, changed from baseline at day 15. We did see a significant treatment uh, result difference uh, that was observed in change from baseline to day 15 in the worst region of the study eye in all four studies. In the phase two trial, we had p-value of 0.009, and it ranged from that to stride three, and stride two had p-values of less than 0.0001. Improvement in total corneal fluorescein staining favoring KPI 1 to 21 quarter percent was observed in stride two with a p of 0.0131, and in stride three with a p-value of 0042. When we look at the efficacy results for symptom, a statistically significant treatment effect was achieved for the primary ocular symptom endpoint of change from baseline to day 15 in the ODS scores in stride one and stride three. An anomaly significant treatment difference was also demonstrated for phase two. Now, in phase two, the primary endpoint was day 29 rather than at day 15, so it was only nominally significant. The p-values were significant in phase two and in stride one and stride three, but not in stride two. We also looked at ocular discomfort severity in a group of the ITT that, ha that came into the study with um, a more severe baseline symptomatology. And in that group, a statistically significant treatment effect for the second pre-specified primary endpoint of change for baseline to day 15 in the ITT subgroup that we just talked about was observed for stride one and stride three. And in phase two, a positive treatment effect was also observed, but didn't achieve significance. I have the p-values for that if we need them. Mm -hmm. um, in looking at safety, we did a pooled safety uh, of all findings in all four studies. And the most frequently reported treatment-related adverse event was installation site pain, which was reported in about 5.2% of subjects in the um, KPI 121 group and about 4.4% of subjects in the vehicle group. Uh, we also looked at intraocular pressure because we know that intraocular pressure increases can occur with steroids. So in the KPI 121 quarter percent group, 
uh, in vehicle groups, respectively, there was only 0.6% and 0.3% of the subjects that experienced greater than five millimeter of mercury increase from baseline, resulting in an IOP greater than 21 millimeters of mercury, either uh, the study eye or the pillow eye at any post baseline visit. So just concluding, all four studies showed statistically significant treatment differences in, in both signs and symptoms for KPI 121 quarter percent over vehicle for the predefined ocular sign endpoint of change from baseline in conjunctival hyperemia and KPI 121 quarter percent was significantly improved patient reported symptoms as well as was measured by ODS in the phase two, stride one and stride three. Improvement in cornea Corneal fluorescein staining in favor of KPI 121 quarter percent was also observed in two of the phase three trials. And as far as safety, the IOP profile is similar between the vehicle and KPI 121 arms. And also the treatment rate emergent adverse events, the most, the most uh, severe one was installation site pain, and it was either mild or moderate in severity, and there were no serious ocular treatment emergent adverse events. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. And I would like to acknowledge a special thanks to my clinical operations team of Mary Berkland, Donna Besner, and Jean Ritchie. Okay. Very nice. And before we go on to talk more about the research, I was curious if you could just take a, a moment and kind of highlight what is unique about the mechanism of action for this particular product candidate. Sure. So the thing that makes our product different is that it's a nanoparticle. It is milled down to the nanogram level, and it is then put into a sort of a package, which is the Amplify technology, which is a mucus penetrating particle that then allows the drug to pass through the mucus and penetrate to the cornea, where it can be deposited more effectively. And so what are the next steps for this research um, based on all these, these trials that you've just had or compared? What is, what is the next step for your research? Well, the product itself, um, we're hoping to gain the name ISUVIS. That's what's under review by the FDA. So ISUVIS is being reviewed by the FDA, and we have the hope of it being approved by the end of the year. And based on our interactions with the FDA today, we believe we have enough clinical data now for approval. And once the product is approved and on the market, what we'll do is listen to the feedback from clinicians once they start using the product. Um, and at that point, we'll just determine if we need to do any kind of phase four expansion of studies moving forward. What, how might the findings from this presentation be applied in the day to day? I think these findings are really exciting for clinicians. As you know, we see a lot of dry eye patients that come into clinical practice, there really is the broad gamut. There's patients that have mostly episodic or flare disease, and then there's patients that have chronic disease and then have some acute exacerbations or flares. And so steroids are really excellent molecules for treating inflammation and treating it quickly. And I think that the study results definitely support that. But one thing that always is kind of in the back of the mind of the clinician is the safety profile of the steroid. And it's why we probably don't use steroids as often or, you know, sort of get a little nervous around using steroids with patients. But they're very, you know, impactful in terms of improving the signs and symptoms of dry eye that was reported in the study. And so hopefully that will mirror our own clinical practice, but it's nice to have a molecule that is really going to help us manage that acute disease. And I guess I'll ask you the same this next question as well. So what are you most excited about with regard to advances in dry eye disease at this, at this point in time? <laughs> well, you know, dry eye is really an ever-changing uh, space. And I think it's just so remarkable to see how much um, progression there's been in terms of novel therapies, novel molecules, novel procedures. And, you know, this, this product, should it be FDA approved, will just be another excellent tool in our tool belt. And um, after many years of, you know, gaining experience and treating patients with dry eye, I would say the one thing I can guarantee with certainty is that not all dry eye patients are the same, but that we need a plethora of therapies to really help to kind of holistically approach dry eye and to treat all the different components of what contribute to dry eye. Okay, well, that's great. And, you know, 
continued success to both of you. And we look forward to hearing more in the coming weeks and months for the news about your products candidate and uh, the approval. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking time with us.